Right, good morning everyone. Um, I'll just flick to the air and make sure that that is actually being what it's supposed to be. Yes, that appears to be right. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, I tried to move myself into the center of the image. Right, so today we're going to talk ethics. Um, now, uh, some of this is, is repeat of stuff that some of you may have dealt with me before, some of the, the discussion around ethics. Now, I said I'd start at, at 8.30, so I'll give people another couple of minutes to come in. Um, there are, however, some, some interesting things that, that um, I would like people to try. Um, so I'll put some of those additional things into the Discord. Um, and <clears throat> for, for today, um, I'm quite happy for people to either type in Discord, talk to me on Discord, or, or try and comment on YouTube. Um, we're also using Kahoot today. So um, if you go to the Get uh, Kahoot It link, uh, you'll be able to, to join in and give a vote on the survey. And I see uh, Nomi has created her, her name in there. Um, so we'll, that will come in in about sort of yeah, 20 minutes in. Um, okay, so we've got another minute to go. But um, ethics is a big topic. Um, it's something that um, you could do whole philosophy degrees over, right? And, and certainly in, in the law, ethics is, is an important part of understanding the relationships between, between ethics and, and the law and, and um, personal morals. So... We're going to discuss those. So I might as well start seeing I think we're probably ready to go and enough of you can are uh, there. Well, I mean, I've got four on Discord and um, some and four watching on um, uh, YouTube. You, you may have to watch on YouTube for the um, Kahoot to work. So I'll try and make sure we have that working properly. Okay, so <coughs> let's get underway. Ethics. Um, ethics sits within a framework of, of other words related to behaviours. Um, so when we're, what we're thinking about here is, is legal, ethical and moral. So legal are what some form of legal authority says is right. right? So that's, that's what's legal, is what's in the, in the law um, as written by, by a parliament, a government, a, uh, an authorised group. Um, ethical usually refers to the system a group uses to make that decision of what is right and wrong. So again, it is about what's right and wrong, it's just that it, rather than being a law, it is a collective who has decided that this is what we consider good behaviour, it's what we consider ethical. Uh, and the last one is, is moral. So what do you personally feel about something? Right, so so these are, are three different kind of layers where the legal is defined by by the state, ethical defined by your organisations or your collectives, and morals by yourself. So um, you look at the kind of um, Euler diagram. Um, it's not a Venn diagram. Um, well, actually, no, that one is a Venn diagram, but an Euler diagram, um, and you see the overlap of legal ethical and moral um, and that discussion around like living in the center of that area right that's that's where you most of us live most of the time right most of what we do is both ethically acceptable morally acceptable to ourselves and legal um, you certainly can find things that fit in other areas so um, there are a number of people who consider marijuana to be in the moral, it's morally fine to have, have marijuana, but legally not, right? So it's not inside the legal category, but it is inside the moral. Um, for ethical but not legal, um, well, <clears throat> yeah, so ethical and not legal, is it could be your group has a, um, uh, a, a rule in it where, you know, if you have a, uh, an anti-fascist group, um, Violence might be against the law, but you might decide ethically it is your responsibility as a member of that group to commit that particular criminal act. Right? So it is possible to find 
um, actions in each area of this graph. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, um, it can be an interesting debate to see where all of these issues fit in, and certainly where the morals of individuals or the ethics of groups within society lead the legal system, where they, they drive the legal system to particular viewpoints. So as we as Canada has legalised marijuana, that's, that's the moral uh, morals of individual citizens driving the legal um, system, right? So creating laws. Um, we also have some, some logic, unfortunately, in, in all of this. We have, to, we have to understand what we're doing and talking about. So legal, explicitly allowed by law, not uh, not legal and not illegal, right? So these are things that are not covered by law, liking strawberry ice cream. Um, it's not illegal to like strawberry ice cream. It's also not legal. You're not requ legally required to like strawberry ice cream. So it's there isn't actually a law that covers your desire to eat strawberry ice cream. So um, it is just not covered. So it's in the, the area outside of both legal and illegal. So illegal things are explicitly not allowed by the law. So for example, um, when we talk about marijuana, often we talk about decriminalization. Um, technically is what we're doing is, is often they are removing it from the criminal code. They're not explicitly writing into law that you have the right to smoke marijuana they're saying it's not illegal to smoke marijuana and then you might have city councils creating bans in certain areas because they're not infringing on a legal right that you have to smoke marijuana and they are just um, policing something that no longer has uh, a legal system around it so so understanding the differences between those are quite important when we start talking about something being ethical or unethical or a, a like yeah aethical so un, uncovered right um, so so not covered by an ethical system okay so we are computer scientists um, and um, oh that's the old slide I will delete that and give you the new slide because that's the old slide um, that was an old slide that's sneaked in. Um, I have updated since then and I will present that and move it over here and take OBS and take its Windows Capture 2 and change the settings and grab it to being that one. Okay. Right. Okay. So um, what we're talking about here is a, a code of ethics that is related to being a member of programming groups. So the ACM and the um, IEEE are two of the, the main groups that, that deal with... Um, hello again. Um, so the ACM and IEEE are groups that deal with, with ethics. Um, so you can personally join the ACM. So you, um, we can be an institutional member as well as, as a... Um, individual member. As an individual member, you are required to obey the code of ethics, right? So this is to maintain your membership, you have to do this. Um, for the IEEE, again, to maintain membership, you have to be um, willing to abide by these regulations. So um, what we look at is, is um, they spell out what's expected of a member. Now, uh, and you can those links take you to both of them. The um, IEEE is shorter. Um, the ACM is much longer. But um, we'll have a look at the, the the start of the ACM. There is more that we can talk about. But um, these are the kind of headlines. Um, we need to positively contribute to society. We need to avoid harm. We need to be honest and trustworthy. Um, be fair and take actions not to discriminate. Um, to respect the work. Um, required to produce new ideas, um, to respect privacy, to honour confidentiality, to strive to achieve high quality in the work that we produce, um, to maintain high standards of professional competence and, and training, um, 
to know and respect existing rules pertaining to professional work. So um, these bind together into basically saying, you know, don't be a dick, right? Um, you are required by being a member of this organization to be a good citizen, right? To be a, 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 a good corporate citizen, right? Someone who, who works for the betterment of society rather than just for money, not being a mercenary. So um, the, the section two, four, is actually rather than 30, is perform work only in areas of competence. Now that's, that's an interesting one. So let's say it is unethical for me to program in um, Rust because I'm not competent in Rust. I've not programmed in Rust before. So it'd be unethical for me to produce work in something that I was not competent in, um, which means I should become competent and then produce work. Now that's, that's, that's quite a high bar to set. Um, and it could be very difficult to meet that. So, so I, some of these ethical requirements you might find tricky to fulfill, right? And actually the um, design and implement systems that are robustly and usably secure. So it, it is unethical to leave security holes in your software. It is unethical to leave bugs in your code. Um, so as a, like an ethical system, when we look at new technologies, and particularly in this kind of course, where we're talking about new technologies, some of these le um, professional ethics of the ACM start competing with our ability to kind of try new things because by definition we will not be competent in those new technologies so um, you have to find a balance and say well actually maybe it's not my own competence maybe I am more competent than other people at this so I am the best that this organization has and so professionally I will do the best that I can I'll make everyone aware that I'm not particularly good at this new technology and I'm learning it, but it might not be unethical to do work in that area so long as people know about it, right? So, so these questions aren't just a single, oh, tick the box, you're done. You do actually have to think about it in the situation you're in. Um, now, when we start looking at, at how do you decide ethical frameworks and how do you respond to the requirements of an ethical framework. Um, now, uh, this is a, a, a nice quote, um, to, a to a pacifist, a broken gun is a good design. If you have an ethical requirement to do no harm, and therefore you're designing a gun, and, and say you're designing a gun, therefore designing a broken gun fulfills one of your ethical principles of doing no harm, but might fail another principle of always doing your best work, right? So um, often the interesting parts of society are when exactly there is this conflict, the conflict between when the, the rule says you, you need to do one action and you're ethically required to do a different action, right? That you are, are, are in a dilemma. Um, and at that point we start to discuss, well, how, how do we... How do we balance off requirements? Right? So this is where we start looking at some broad theories of, of moral and ethical behavior. So um, consequentialist theories. So we talk about theories that um, relate to the consequences of the actions you take. So utilitarianism is the poster child of this, where what you do is you look at the consequences of your actions, you look at what that might end up in, and then you... Um, you judge it based on the maximum good for the maximum number of people, right? Now that, that can be very tricky, particularly when we look at things like the trolley problem, which we'll do in a minute, um, and it's kind of harder to decide to take action um, and, and actively do things that will hurt people when you know that it's hurting fewer people, right? So um, there's the uh, egoist, so the consequence is the what's the greatest good for me? So if I get the greater good, that's all good. So so that's also a consequentialist, right? Now, um, <laughs> in balancing up the ethical behavior, a an egoist will look at the code of ethics of the ACM and say, well, okay, being a member is beneficial to me. 
So it's beneficial to me to follow those rules up until the point where it's more beneficial for me to break that rule than be a member of the ACN. Right? So it's that kind of um, how do you make a decision on which rule you break and the egoist will do it by feelings of what's good for them. <coughs> um, you can also look at common good, um, consequentialism. So where, where what you look at is you look at the what would the group decide? What would the group want to be the, the decision? Um, so you, you're trying to find common good. Uh, there's there's non-consequentialist. Um, so there's duty ethics where you look at what the, the rules are, right? And so um, deontological systems like Kant's categorical imperative um, are not so much about the consequence of your actions, but the acts itself, right? So um, if you decide that murder is, um, or killing is unethical, just doesn't matter the situation, any act where you kill someone is unethical, then uh, it, you cannot take any action that kills someone and decide that that was an ethical act. It is always unethical to do this, right? So, so there is no, what is the consequence of what I did? It is now like the doing it itself was, was unethical. Um, you can look at bills of rights, which say these are the rights people have. I don't care about the consequences. Um, you can look at things like fairness and justice, where, where you try and evaluate what is fair and what is just for our society. Um, and you've got weird ones like, well, weird ones. There are the there pinch more common ones like um, divine command, right? So it's not the result that's important. It's that there was demand, divine command. This is what is told to me is ethical. Therefore, I have to follow it irrespective of consequences. Um, and there's, there's agent-centered as well. So there's, there's virtue ethics. Um, so there's a whole set, set series on, on what would make me a good person. And feminist ethics. Um, where <clears throat> feminist ethics is, is a long debate around feminism. And there's first wave, second wave, and third wave feminism. That's a long debate, a whole lecture all on its own. But the general early first and second wave feminists were very much not advancing women but advancing the the principles that caring for people was part of an ethical system right that that you that care was important it's not uh you can't just treat people's numbers you can't just um evaluate them as 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 a um piece of meat you've got to actually care for people right so it's um what might be called humanist in some places um so are we all following along? You understand everything I'm saying so far? I've got one comment. Um, but it's not always me that decides when something is really... <laughs> it is true. It might be not be you that decides when something is shipped. Uh, and you could then claim that your boss was unethical in shipping a product that you hadn't completed. Um, so yes, that... <clears throat> Your ethics in your group, it may be that you decide that someone in your team is unethical or, some, or your boss is unethical um, or some of your clients are unethical. So uh, that's all part of kind of working out from a, an ethical standpoint where we stand in, and, and how to evaluate these. So, so those are our general theories around um, morality. So if we look at morals... Um, so those are kind of ethical frameworks. These are, and when, when we often talk about morals, we, we start moving down to the individual. So um, sticking to a moral code is, so a moral failure is a failure of yourself. An ethical failure is a failure f for your group and a legal failure is a failure of your, for your society, right? So, so if you do something illegal, we find ways of society punishing you. If you do something unethical, your, your group will do something to punish you. And if you do something immoral to your own morality, then you find ways of punishing you. Now, um, there's an interesting case, like, situation here where, where do we go into um, relativistic models uh, and cultural relativism, where I say that something might be morally acceptable in my culture, um, <clears throat> which is morally unacceptable in other cultures. Uh, and certainly that's true of legally. Um, acceptable and legally um, oh, oh, illegal in other cultures. So homosexuality has, has has become that issue around the world. Gay marriage is in, in that thing. Marijuana is legal in some and not in others. Um, 
disrespecting your elders um, is, is might be an unethical to treat elderly people differently to young people. Um, and in some situations, you're supposed to treat them differently, and other people would say that that was unethical. So, so different societies have different ethical standards. Um, how people choose their own personal moral standards, um, <clears throat> the majority of the world seems to use some sort of church or God-based system to decide what is moral. Um, that is is uh, tricky um, because <clears throat> when when two religions um, disagree around what is an acceptable action, then you get a lot of tension, a lot of friction because they're not doing it by a, a rational evaluation of the situation. They're doing it adhering to a strict set of rules, and so those when those rules disagree, you get significant conflict. Um, you could, instead of using, say, a church or God, you could use the people you respect. Um, but then that becomes very subjective, right? Who do I respect? Maybe I respect church, church elders. Maybe I respect criminals. Maybe I respect murderers. Um, just using the people I respect to decide my moral compass might not be good. Some decide that the law is what defines what is social and what is what is ethical and moral. So as long as it's legal, it's ethical and moral. Um, that collapses all of those circles and gives them just one, which is the law. And then so long as they're following the law, they can do any damn thing they like. So um, at, <clears throat> at that point, you start saying, well, I mean, if we're talking D&D, &D, that would be um, lawful neutral or potentially lawful evil, where they have no care at all about people, but they will follow the law consistently right so so you can you can think of these as 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 when you come up with your own moral opinions um, on something you can make some decisions around whether you agree with an ethical standpoint or not if you are going to be a member of an of a society that has a group of ethics you have to read and understand those ethics so when we ask you to write about ethics in relation to um, new technologies uh, or in relation to serious games um, I am interested in also that discussion of, of the whole ethical and moral and social framework. So, so um, when you look at some a, a technology, you could make a case that it causes harm. You could make a case that it discriminates. You could make a case that uh, it is not your area of competence. So you could actually use some of those ACM areas and say, well, okay, this technology leads to problems in these ethical areas for the ACM code of ethics or for the IEEE code of ethics. So, so that's actually a way that you can structure an ethical debate around what are the rules of the society that I particularly am interested in either being a member of or following the rules of. <clears throat> so um, some, some classic um, ethics for you, just to try of, of bring you up to speed. I don't know how many of you know Kant's categorical imperative do any of you know Kant's categorical imperative? Can I get some thumbs up in, in Discord? Are there anybody who knows Kant's? Well, you've, you've got it here. Um, so the, the categorical imperative is that um, the idea is that most of what you do is actions to satisfy desires. Right? So our desire satisfaction. So most of what I do is I'm trying to do, yes, Immanuel Kant. Um, so that's the right one. You, you know at least his name. Even his first name. It's great. Um, so his categorical imperative um, helps you try and work out what's right and wrong by trying to look at it to say, is this a universal law? Right? So behave in ways that should be universal. So what I... So if... Um, I, you know, if I feel that theft, or yeah, if, if, if I see someone stealing something, um, I would make laws to say, no, no, stealing is wrong, um, which means I also cannot steal things, right? So if I steal things, what I'm saying is I expect people to steal things from me, and I would want it to become universal. I would want everybody to start stealing, right? So any action, ethical action I take, any action I take, I would want people to apply the principle I'm using in this situation to all interactions with me. 
right? So um, if I lie, then I expect people to constantly lie to me and I'd want them to lie to me, right? So I, I'm, I'm acting in ways that I would want things to be universal. Um, <clears throat> and Kant also was firm on the you treat humanity as an end in itself rather than a means to an end. So people are not there to help you achieve what you want. They are their own individuals with their own end. They have their own objectives and that their objectives need to be respected. You cannot just use them like they're tools. Right? So, so he was very strongly that, that, that you should act in this universal the categorical imperative way and that you should respect people as individuals right so any action you then take and so when you think of writing code and you think of 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 casing a new technology or developing new technology or privacy if you breach someone's privacy what you're saying is you expect everybody to breach all privacy at all times right so you've got to try and work out what like what is the the universality of the actions you're taking um of course utilitarian i see if we get to it um you do things um, that is the, the thing that is best for the most people. Now, it, best is then has to be operationalized. Best is not a well-defined term. Um, and so there is this conundrum over, is, is it just pleasure? Are you just trying to create the maximum pleasure for the maximum number of people? And so if you're making games, um, particularly very addictive games, which people say they are happy with, um, is that what best for them because they're really enjoying this terribly fatty food or or this these these chocolate snacks or this very addictive game that they really enjoy but if you're destroying other parts of their lives is the pleasure that they get from the game still the best outcome right so best becomes quite a hard thing to define at this point um, however often people will use pleasure as that definition um, you and your family are not import more important than any other human being. This is potentially the hardest bit of everybody for utilitarianism is if there are, in the trolley problem, if there is um, three people on one track and my wife and my child on another track, I should kill my wife and child to save three random people I don't know because three is more than two. Right? That is really, really hard, right? As a as a rule. So so most people are not particularly good at following a utilitarian ethical framework because we do care more about people who are close to us. Um, it is also um, that they, they say, well, what you should be doing is not applying it to yourself. You should be thinking of it if you were advising a stranger about nobody you know what advice would you give? So you try and make yourself, um, yeah, as, as distant from the decision as possibility. Um, <coughs> so yeah, so you, you, you are trying to, to kind of um, distance yourself and be objective and, and be all this, oh, I'm just weighing up people to see who's got more rights. And it just often doesn't work. Um, it also leads to potential around hedonism. Um, where we are just looking for the maximum pleasure all the time, right? And that that utopian total pleasure all the time scenario is certainly one in VR that we're starting to discuss is that, you know, if you enjoy VR more than your real life, should you just live in VR and get a drip to keep you your body going uh, until you die of a heart attack or starvation? Um, you had a pleasurable life, it was short, but it was pleasurable. I, I, yeah, it's, it becomes a, a, a very, very much a challenge of how long do you measure good for, right? So um, what is the consequence? So another part of the contract, um, consequence ethics is um, contractarian. So um, this is where we look at, at social contracts as our way of deciding what's right and wrong and what's ethical or not. So, so when we look at applying new technology, you say, well, what's the social contract we have here? Um, this is particularly interesting with driverless cars. Um, are driverless cars unethical because you are um, breaking a social contract around um, the right to work, right? So the right to be in control. 
Um, there is an interesting Bill of Rights, I think it's either been passed or is coming in, um, the EU might have proposed it, which is the right to human contact. So when, some, when an organisation is making a decision about you, do you have the right to have that reviewed by a human being? And is that just a nice thing or is it a right that you have as a human being to demand another human being assess your situation? Um, so yes, that social contract, what is the, the contractual agreement that we have around a technology or around actions? Um, and if you go around consequentialism, you certainly do go into this actions are not important, it's only consequences. Um, and so that means that any action is acceptable so long as the consequences of that action are, are acceptable. So that, that also leads you to some fairly strange behaviours. Right, so as I said, about uh, 20 minutes, 20, half an hour, um, we're going to do a coat. So we're going to actually, I'm going to go through some ethical dilemmas and the group, hopefully some of you have signed up for Coot. Um, I will go to here and I will do control shift two. Ah, yep, I go to there and then go there and go, ha, we have, most people seem to have signed up. So we'll start the Coot now. Um, so I'm gonna do six questions and these are ethics in games questions. So the trolley problem. So the first problem here is the trolley problem. Um, when you have the trolley problem, I'll quickly explain it, you've got four options here. You are this person standing with a lever. There is a tram coming. You can either leave it alone and let the tram hit five people and kill them all, or you can switch the lever and have it kill one person. So the ethical question here is, do you switch the lever and feel good that you've done the right thing? Do you switch the lever and feel bad that you've killed someone? Do you leave the lever and feel good because I, I did nothing? It's not my fault that the, the tram was destined to hit those five people um, and I have not taken an action that has caused someone to die. Right? So that's I don't do it and I feel good that I have, I, ha I have got clean hands. Or do I leave the lever and feel terrible because... Um, I feel bad that I, part my decision to some extent have has resulted in in somebody in potentially more people dying than potentially could have, but I was unwilling to make that decision. Now I've got four of these people who have made an answer. There seems about five, and we're gonna to get to six. Six, there we go. So where are we with six? Aha. So you guys all feel bad. This is a good sign. Um, so so it's interestingly, there are two of you that tend to go down more of a deontological um, kind of non-act um, utilitarian approach where you say, well, actually, no, no, my action, I will not take actions that cause the death of people. And four of you were willing to take an action that would kill people. Now, um, if we skip back to the lecture and I go forward in the lecture, we have the trolley problem. Um, so if you, and, and I'll just get back to here and go control Yeah, so that link, so if you've got the link to the slides, you'll be able to find that. That is a game of the trolley problem that you can play. You don't have to play it now, but you can play it later. Um, where you go through various iterations of the trolley problem, um, including whether you would kill your wife or children or things like that. So so it, it gets more personal as, as you get in. But it's it's interesting to see that we've got that, um, that particular combination of, of um, lever pulling and not pulling and um, uh, feel, but you all feel bad, which is, is interesting. So none of you are, are, are strong enough in your ethical position on your action that you are willing to say, I feel good. Now, technically that would be um, a very Aristotelian approach because uh, one of the differences between Plato and, and Aristotle is Plato would argue that having made the best moral choice, you should feel good at it. And Arist Aristotle would argue that, no, no, any action that leads to bad consequences, you should feel bad about, right? So even the best situation, given a bad, um, a bad system, you feel bad about. So, so there are actually historically differences. Um, and you guys all fall down on the slightly more modern Aristotelian approach. 
Um, so if we have a look at the next problem, pony stars. Now, I'll introduce this as a situation and then we'll skip to the coot to make the, the thing. Now, um, some of you have heard my pony stars talk many times, so I will try and do it quickly. So, Pony Stars was a game that was a Swedish game that I heard about at a, a Nordic game, um, where they had a hundred thousand players uh, in Sweden, and they were teenage you know, tweens, so they're young girls, uh, sort of between eight and, and twelve, fourteen. And as a game, they had made this game where you you know you brush and you look after ponies and you could buy them saddles and bridles and paint them different colours and you can take them out to shows and stuff. So you you do things with ponies. Now. What they then done is they said, okay, so what's what's the best monetization system? So they looked at you know, standard game technology around marketing um, uh, and A-B testing. So they broke their users into a bunch of, of groups for A and B. Um, and the groups that they made, uh, the they looked at different ways of monetizing. So do you pay a subscription? Do you micropayment? Within micropayment, do you buy each pony? Or do you buy items for ponies? When you buy an item for a pony, do you buy one item per pony? Or do you buy a category of items? Like you buy a brush and every one of your ponies gets that pretty brush. Or you buy decals, um, stickers to put on your pony and then every one of your ponies gets stickers. Or do you have to buy stars for each of the individual ponies? So, so what kind of unlocking system is it using? The, tr the neat thing was that the, the one that makes the most money was um, not any of those systems. It was actually a uh, let everyone have as much stuff and as many ponies as they like, but each pony had to be brushed and fed each night. Right? So once a day you had to brush and feed your ponies and you had to manually do this. And so it took you a minute. Right? So for one pony, one minute a night, pff, nothing. But once you had like 40 ponies, it was taking you 40 minutes to an hour with the change over time um, to maintain your stable of 40 ponies. And that an hour of work every night starts adding up. Um, and, so and so what they did is they offered um, a fairy service. The fairy would feed and brush the pony for you. Um, so you wouldn't have to. So this is, you know, a service. Then, you know, very much like real ponies, you can pay someone to look after them for you. And, you know, some of the people were converting into have, using the fairy service to brush and feed their ponies. And, and so they were paying the, the small monthly um, or daily amount for the, the, pony to, the fairy to look after the ponies. When they got a big uptick was at school holidays where you're away from the Internet. And they could send you an email with a sad pony looking hungry and dirty and saying, please please come and look after us. Or you could pay the fairy, she'll help. Um, and so apparently the best way to make money out of a 10 year old girl is to get her to fall in love with a virtual pony and then threaten to kill it. If you threaten to kill the pony, she will find you money. Um, so digital extortion. Now, <laughs> in, in normal society, we have law, laws against, digital ex against real extortion. Um, but we don't have any rules around digital extortion. We don't have any laws or, or systems that could keep up with this kind of what I would consider evil act on this end of, you know, what's the easiest way to make money? Well, you know, you can make money by, by, being, by, by extorting money from small girls. Um, this is, it's a way of making money. I would consider this unethical. Um, however, that would be where I stand. So in the coat, we'll just go to next and um, we'll go uh, there. So for Pony Stars, the question is up to you, the audience. So um, <clears throat> are you on the red opinion of, yes, it's a clever way of making money? Um, or blue, no. Um, but it, 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 well, so, so blue is yes, it's, it's fine, but um, not as a, but you're not allowed to th have threats, right? So you're not allowed to extort money. You can have the fairy. It's okay to have the fairy, but you're not allowed to extort money by threatening to kill ponies. Um, so yellow is uh, no, 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 don't do it. You know, just 
make them pay a subscription that's a bit cleaner. Um, or no, on the harder end of, of no, 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 just just underage, Joe, do, do, you don't you don't make underage people pay for stuff, right? Because like advertising to children, extracting money from children is a bad way of having a business, right? And so we should be we should be we should be advertising to parents and getting money out from parents. So so I see three of you have been willing to take a stand on this. Um, some of my other students in discussing this, these are these are not they, they, they want more options than just these. And and certainly this is a forced choice. I'm not I'm not saying that these are the only answers or even necessarily the best answers, but they're answers I'm interested in. Ah, okay, so so you guys skew down the um down the no route that, that extortion is not good. Um in my third year group here in, in New Zealand, um for this question we got a lot of um, yes, it's a clever way of making money. So about sort of a third of the students thought it was clever, um, which is you know, slightly concerning that, that their desire for money um, extended as far as extorting money from eight-year-old girls is fine. Um, so, whew, um, but you know, I, I, it is Scandinavian environment. I think Scandinavians and Nordics in general are on the don't do this kind of unethical game behavior. So. Um, when you're looking at technology, when you're looking at making money from the technologies you, you guys are experimenting with, um, <laughs> it's clever, it's just wrong. Um, so it is a clever way of doing business, it's just not moral. <laughs> so it's smart, but immoral. So yeah, no, I think, I think um, right, it, yeah. So we are kind of of the opinion that you shouldn't really do this because um, although it's, it's um, smart, it's not good. Um, and that's that's where we can make that distinction. We can say that something was smart and immoral. Um, so a current ethical game issue for you guys: loot boxes. I'm sure some of you have a loot box of opinions. Um, so, what do we think of loot boxes and the gambling technology around them? So, um, this has come to a head with uh, uh, the Netherlands. Um, banning loot boxes um, and uh, the moves around defining loot boxes that you pay money for which drop random items of financial value as being gambling right so so when you fit when you pay real currency right so um, for um, fiducial when you pay um, fiducial currency so real currency for an item that then drops randomly valued items that is gambling by European law and therefore loot boxes are a form of gambling and therefore not allowed in games sold in that country. So this comes down to an ethical opinion around is it ethical to <coughs> add gambling components into your games as a way of, of making money from your game. Right? So, so you know, people want to be able to progress faster, and so rather than buying progress, what they do is you give them loot boxes, and occasionally they get to buy powers up, and they or they get to get powers up from the loot boxes they're buying. Um, and you know, it's a bit random. Um, so, if we have a look at the the uh, coat, um, we move to loot boxes and say red. Yes, money is good. So are you happy to go down the yes, money is good route? Are you happy to go with the yes, but limit the maximum, so a limit of a, a, a maximum per item. So so you can't spend either too much per month or, or you, you can't spend too much per item. So yellow is yes and limit total, or green, no, cash sales of the loot boxes should be and are unethical. Now, um, so this is actually going to be an interesting, this one is more interesting in Europe because there are laws, and particularly Norse Tipping, for example, has a monopoly on gambling in Norway. So there are a, an interesting discussion around, is it just because it's legal, just because there's a legal block on it, do you ethically agree with that legal block? Um, is it unethical to go online and gamble in Sweden or gamble in, in the US, right? So, so you could decide that that is just 
unethical to do to, to have a game where there is any of this kind of component. Um, now, I'm um, right. Yes. So there is a distinction between loot box that gives cosmetic and potential in-game benefits. Now, well, <clears throat> yeah, that's a subtlety. Um, where the European law comes in is, is um, if you would normally have to buy those items and they have value to other players, then it is a financial reward for, for betting a certain amount of money. So for, for the legal aspect, it's still the same. It may be from a gamer and moral perspective, you may say, well, actually, I understand the issue around gambling, but I'm not going to allow this to be a, a, an ethical issue that is blind to the way in which you get the loot. Okay, so <clears throat> we have more of a spread here. So we have one that is, there's no, 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 you don't make money that way. Um, one that, no, no, it's, you know, it's loot boxes, it's fine, right? I mean, it's a game, people know what they're getting, they know that they're paying for this thing, so it's, it's fine. Um, they're not being fooled, they're not being lied to, they're not being seduced in some, like, underhand manner so yeah it could be perfectly fine you could say well it's fine but because we worried about addiction so that's why we feel that we should have a limit per month because there is um although it, it's fine to be spending you know money that is reasonable um we need to pro um, proactively prevent people getting into too much challenge right and so that's why we could put a a monthly cap on it um and that's 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 a kind of um, paternal instinct around caring for people who are potentially addicted and so you're trying to limit that that thing and you could say well no um, you shouldn't start people down the track of gambling because by by starting them in this money gambling scenario they'll start looking for that gambling hit and this could be the gateway into them doing other gambling activities that then ruin their life so you do not want to be part of a system which starts them down that gambling addiction track. So I think those those are perfect. All of them can be perfectly reasonably um, valid ethical positions to have, right? So um, I would, yeah. So for me, loot boxes that are that are cosmetic only, I'm kind of okay with. Um, I don't like paying for advantage in games i feel that that undermines the the nature of the game so so i'm i'm kind i, I would also agree with some of the comments from discord that yeah as long as it's sticking in, in in um only cosmetic then it's not too bad but there is some issue around gambling that i have but um this one different ethical positions in different ethical locations right so different parts of the world you'll get slightly different responses Okay, so um, now I see we've got nine people watching me on, on YouTube. Um, some of you aren't on the um, on the Kahoot. But anyway, we'll, we'll keep going with the Kahoot. If, if you want the link, I can put it in the YouTube discussion to the Get Kahoot. Um, though, does it have the pin? No, it doesn't have the pin showing currently. But um, We'll keep going. I don't know if they can join halfway through anyway. Right. Okay. So the next ethical dilemma that I was going to talk about is um, now this is is close to to um, our own people here. Is my child Levin's born um, now? Uh, Richard, who some of you have met and and who is actually potentially doing this course, is is maybe one of the people watching. Um, is uh, he's created a, a game and he's worked with um, uh, Sarapta to create this game which talks about um, the Nazi eugenics program um, and is a game about caring for a child uh, which are true stories from survivors of the Nazis eugenic program right so this was where they wanted to build to breed pure um, blonde hair blue-eyed Aryan individuals and to do that um, they would take uh, what they considered clean gen genetically clean Aryan stock um, both in Germany and when they occupied Norway in Norway uh, and breed them with SS officers now in Germany they actually were doing this from the 19 mid 1930s uh, 
and they were looking at and and it was a voluntary voluntary program initially where people would women would come in and they'd volunteer to have a baby which they would give up immediately right so so you came in you were matched up and bred with a an SS officer and then you were separated you birthed the baby and then the baby was taken away from you you never saw the baby again and you went back to your home uh, in Germany um, they then expanded this to somewhat more forced situations in Norway where um, young women were selected rather than volunteered um, which then becomes an even more emotionally tr um, fraught area uh, and regardless of whether you were selected or you volunteered certainly in post-war Norway people who <coughs> collaborated with the Germans were also fairly badly treated after the war right so collaborators were were punished for their collaboration with the germans um and so in this area um whether you were forced or whether you were volunteered both were bad um and certainly the children were treated very badly um so in this game it makes people feel bad right so um so you get comments like this one which is um uh the oh i have to move this slightly so i can read it properly um the train of feelings, this game um, perfectly pulled off how difficult it is, how difficult kids, um, different kids suffer from social isolation. It was painful to see the bullying um, and unfair judgment on these innocent children. I hope there will never ha that we will never have wars um, and have innocent victims. So, so this is a kind of, um, this game made the person feel terrible, right? That's... This is a game, you know, when we talk about, you know, the, the best actions and making people feel good, this is just bizarre that you make a game that makes people feel bad. Now, the counter to that, and if we go and have a look at my the questions I was looking at, um, so the counter to that is saying, um, well, actually, there are a number of games, um, a number of movies, for example, Schindler's List, you don't go to to be entertained. You don't go to, to make you feel good. So um, one of the ethical questions around this is, should you make content that triggers people and makes people unhappy? Should you be allowed, should, should you ethically create games that make people feel bad? Right? Um, so, and the answer is, well, one option is yes. People pay for experiences. So, uh an experience where you feel sadness and you feel, um, you know, people go to horror movies they, to feel afraid. So this is a perfectly reasonable answer. Um, perfectly good to make it, but maybe not promote it to everyone saying, hey, you've got to play this game, you've got to play this game. Um, this was particularly a question we had here in New Zealand where some of the psychologists said, yeah, mm -hmm. oh, that could be emotionally traumatic for people and you could scar them maybe maybe only let them see it once they've read about the scenario and understand what they're getting in for. Um, or yes, but um, keep it to hosted events. And so that would be moving even further saying, well, no, it's, it's fine that you've made this game, but you should only do it where you can talk to people and actually saying, look, okay, um, this is a scenario, we're going to learn about this thing. Um, once you've played it, we can talk about the emotions you have, we can talk about what it triggered, we can talk about rape, we can talk about child abuse, we can talk about all of the issues that come up in the game. Um, <coughs> or you could go down the, no, 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 just, no, no, just don't, no. Um, I don't care how meaningful it is, but just don't, don't do that. It's, it's just not the way we want to live. So um, this, this, um, in, in New Zealand, we actually had a pretty strong showing on this as being um, uh, yes, appropriate to make. And we've got the same here. So so you, you've you also said yes, and it's basically fine. People pay for experiences. It's like Schindler's List. It's like horror movies. People pay for go. Um, and now they would certainly make it, but you don't need to go out there and, and kind of throw it, put it in people's faces and say, hey, hey, come and experience the horrors of war. Yay. Um, so, so yeah, it's, 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 it, you've got to find that balance. So, so I think both of those are reasonable. Um, I personally am a bit more on the yes, people pay for experiences. 
I think this is a, an interesting experience. However, I certainly have heard from the psychologists um, here, they worry about it triggering people and, you know, um, going through a traumatic scenario where you are caring for someone who is being hurt um, can be bad for you. So you, they were wanting some structure around it. Um, so if we go to the next... The, now, now we go a, a slightly lighter topic, um, and if I get this right, yes, um, handball. Now, cheating in games is an interesting um, uh, technical challenge, right? Because in games, we can allow you to cheat, or we can stop you from cheating, right? So, so in this handball cheating scenario, scenario, so this is. A few years old now. Some of you may have been watching the World Cup when this happened. But um, so Luis Suarez um, uh, in I think Uruguay versus Ghana, or I think it was something like that. Um, there was a header coming for the line, um, and he, <coughs> the goalkeeper, had already saved it and was out of position, and so he had time because the ball was traveling relatively slowly to make a decision to break the laws of. The football and use his hands to stop the goal, or to um, to to leave his hands to the side and let the ball go in. Right. So the ethical question we're going to ask you is, what is the right thing to do? Now, um, I have had this situation. Um, I I I was followed this situation and I looked online and I found it very interesting to see how people fell internationally on this particular issue. So. Um, do you, and here we go back to the trolley problem of, yes, you use your hands and you're proud and happy that, yes, yes, because his team actually won this game because the guns missed the free kick that it was given. He was red carded um, and then they won the extra time. And so he was joyously happy when they missed the penalty, right? So he, he felt wonderful that he'd done the right thing. Um, do you do it? but then feel bad that you've cheated and you know that what you've done dishonors the, the rules, but it was still the right thing to do. It was just a, a bad situation. Um, do you not do it and go, oh, well, you know, they scored, but I'm a good person because I didn't cheat and I don't care that we've missed out on the World Cup. I didn't cheat, so, so that's best. Or do you not do it and then feel bad because... You know you could have done something, but you were unwilling to cheat, and you still feel bad that you're unwilling to cheat, but you didn't cheat. Right? So, <clears throat> so I was one interesting in in in, in uh, we seem to only have five people, so I might just skip forward, given the sixth person seemed to have potentially dropped out. Oh no, we got the sixth answer in. Right. So the answer is no, and feel happy. Right, so so we we four of you are in the know, but and feel fine that you didn't cheat. You followed the rules, and it's all good. One of you says yes and feel bad, and one of you said no and feel bad. So <clears throat> we have a, a, a five to one ratio of following the rules. Um, now online, this was about fifty fifty. Um, now for some people, the act of cheating is part of the game, and if you took that away, the game wouldn't be wouldn't feel right, it wouldn't feel good to, to be, play football and not be able to foul people and not be able to get red cards. Because football has red cards, it has fouling, so the game of it should mimic reality. There's another group who say, no, but those are illegal actions, you shouldn't, when you know you can police it, why don't you just stop it? And, and so that becomes down the argument of simulation versus enforcement right and so that's a that's an interesting ethical dilemma when it comes to to making making rules and and forcing them in games um oh. uh, that one <coughs> okay so i think we're on to the last one yep so this was going to be a quick one um so back in 1996 so um many of you were not uh, well I think all of you were probably alive. 22? It's a, it's a long time ago. Maybe some of you are 21. Um, so back in 1996, I was doing my fourth year at university. Like you're doing, you're doing your fifth year, I was doing fourth year. Um, and we were asked by my AI lecturer 
to help her husband, who was working at the radiology unit at the hospital, to rank patients. Um, so we were to take medical data, look at the size of tumours, um, the type of tumour, the age of the person, um, the other comorbidities, so other things wrong with them, rank, like, like take the medical literature, work out all the prognosis, how likely they were to survive and how long they would survive given treatment or not given treatment, and then rank all the patients to say, hey, okay, that's so, so who should we treat? Who should we definitely not treat? And who's in the middle that the doctors would need to look at? Um, the challenge came that they wanted us to include social factors. And by that, a solo mother with two children um, should be ranked more highly than a 65-year-old man um, because she is more valuable to society than he is. Uh, and so they wanted us to come up with numbers and put those into the ranking so that the solo mum would get a boost and move up the ranking and the retired man would drop down the ranking even though he was more likely to survive for longer from the treatment her social value was higher. Um, so the question was, having done this as an assignment at university, what is the appropriate response as a student, you as a student? So you say you've been developing this AI system, you've got it working. So do you um, give over the assignment, give over all, all the code and supply all the numbers and say, yeah, no, it's fine, right? You've you, the lecturer has asked me to do this, therefore any ethical problem is the lecturer's, not mine. Do I say here, yes, you can have the code, but I'm not going to supply any of the numbers we came up with, so I can show you, I, I give you the code, but I'm not going to give you our numbers, so I can show you that it works, but I'm going to take all the numbers and I'm going to hide them because I don't, don't want those numbers to go out into production and just sneak through into a final system. Do you say, no, I'm not going to give you the code of that ranking system, um, but I'll show you a video of it working. Or do you go, no, um, I'm not even going to start making this, but you, you've asked me to do this thing. I just, I am not going to rank medical patients. I'm a 21 year old, 22 year old student. <coughs> How am I supposed to know the value of a teenage, of a 20 year old single mum versus a 65 year old retired man? How can I come up, how could I even think of coming up with a number that defines that in the same scale as the prognosis? Um, so actually, I was at an um, AI forum last night um, and we were discussing the use of algorithms in government. Uh, and this is an example of using, using an algorithm to make medical decisions. Um, and so they were, they were discussing, and, and part of the discussion was um, when you get a loan, when you get treatment, when, when you get a house, when... Um, you're given services. What, what algorithms are used to make those decisions? And should it be algorithms or human beings that make those decisions? Now, in this case, the, the doctors um, said, well, no, 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 you, you, you can triage it. So you tell us the ones we should certainly treat, the ones we certainly shouldn't treat, and we'll still look at the ones in the middle. But, you know, it was really stressful for me. And this was the situation I was in um, with the group that I was working with. Right, so three of you would say, no, nope, I don't care that that's the, one of the assignments. I'm not going to touch that. It's just wrong. One of you is, is no, no, um, I'll show you the video of it, of, of it ranking people, but I'm not going to show you my numbers or give you my code. One of you is willing to do um, the, we will, we will give you the code, but we'll take all the numbers out. You can put your own numbers in. Uh, so actually, uh, we as a group did did the the yellow option, right? So we got it working and we got all of the things ranking. We showed the lecturer a video of it working, and then we deleted the code and said, no, nope, we don't we don't want our code to ever be used in that way because we were not as teen, as you know as as university students so confident in our ability to correctly de develop a decision tree, de um, uh, uh, an expert system, um, using various numbers and various weights to guarantee that we, would, we had not screwed up and that they wouldn't potentially put someone into the definitely don't treat who should have been treated. Right? So even though they're triaging and say, well, you know, just have the definitely don't treats and the definitely treats and then leave the middle for the doctors. It's the, well, do you know, it's code. I, 
don't want to kill people. Um, and you know, this is this was life and death because they had four hundred people come in to the uh, so on the sorry on the waiting list. They had three hundred people in the waiting list. You would add two hundred people per year, and you'd treat one hundred people per year. So, and the waiting list would remain at three hundred, because basically. 100 of the 200 people you had added to the waiting list would die every year because and if they didn't receive treatment they would definitely die so you're making a life and death decision that's whew, that was a lot for for a fourth year at university um to to have to deal with okay so um thanks for taking part in our survey um you guys are actually fairly um socialist in your unwillingness to just make random money out of people for no for for um without a kind of clear reason to do it, to do it so or or that you've got a, a reason like the um the loot boxes which were are are potentially acceptable um <clears throat> so i thought i'd just go over and then we'd have a quick chat um about because um i've got you for another quote out so um Pony starts. As developer, there's potential here for it to be a slippery slope. Um, and part of it is focusing too much on what the tech does and how the A-B testing works and, and just not stepping back and not thinking about what those numbers mean for actual human beings. Um, that, oh, look, this system worked better than that system. We'll do that. Without going, okay, so what does it mean when we do this to people? So what are people's feelings? How do, how do people respond? Um, I've got a couple of links here um, on games for understanding um, your own opinion. So here is uh, a, a link to a choose, um, pick your own path text-based adventure game, um, which I think um, some of you should go and play uh, as a way of like looking at some of the ethical decisions you make. And it comes out at the end with a discussion around the ethical positions that you appear to have. Um, and lectures on philosophy. So um, if you're really interested in philosophy and you don't have the chance to take another paper at course at university, then, then um, the YouTube videos of, of lectures on philosophy are quite good. So from, a, um, from an ethical standpoint, so I've only got two of you left in the Discord, but certainly hopefully some of you will be able to type there. Um, in terms of making ethical decisions and being part of our society at NTNU and doing your masters, what for you, and maybe you can write this, what is the most significant ethical issue that you've had to face, right? What was the, the greatest challenge that you've had so far? And of these, which one of them like worries you the most in terms of what you might be asked to do in the future. Yeah, so so Terrio has has done the um, it's not necessarily that ranking is bad because certainly in the medical system there is the discussion that that public health is about rationing rather than about health because we can't possibly spend the massive amount of money to give perfect health to everybody. Um, because, you know, we could keep replacing organs um, for people if we spent enough money on mechanical devices to keep people alive. But, you know, we don't have an infinite amount of money, so we've got a limited resource, and we therefore have to ration it to the people who will benefit most from it. So, so ranking you might have to do. Um, but certainly trusting your own competence and being saying, you know, I know that I'm a fabulous programmer, so uh, I know that I will be the best. Um, so... So when asked to write an ethical section, um, one way of doing it is to refer to the ACM Code of Ethics. Then go and have a look at, at some of the um, categorical imperatives or, or those sort of things and say, well, actually, um, when you look at the ACM Code of Ethics, it says this, this, and this. This technology does this, this, and this, and this is why this could be a problem. Um, so it gives you a framework. You can also look at the IEEE one. It will give you a framework. So um, I have eight people watching me on YouTube. Are any of you willing to, to comment on things that you find a challenge? 
will jump into Discord. Now, I know you guys have a meeting at 10, so I didn't want to go too close to that. Right, so Tony had to leave for a presentation. That's ah, understandable. I, I finished not long after that. So, um, so we have Andreas and thing. So one of the challenges is, is often what we have done as, as a society and what we've done as lecturers is remove ethical dilemmas from um, children. So we've tried to create a society where we don't challenge you um <laughs> yeah no you maybe you haven't looked at the ethical implications of what you're doing um all of you should look at the ethical implications um one of the things i've got to put in the in the in the um template and so therefore i will not um, mark you down for not having is a discussion around the ethical implications of any technology right so in in the course outline it explicitly says that we will talk about ethics so that's partly why I'm explicitly talking about ethics um, for all of you you can think about some of the ethics the all of the AI stuff has eth ethical dilemmas um, things like ray tracing is hard to see how our technology might have an ethical dilemma but there are some things around graphical realism um, so for ray tracing, you're able to, to graphically um, draw very realistic scenes. Um, at what point do you worry about deep fakes with ray tracing? Given that they are able to produce perfect images, um, perfectly physically real images, uh, if I get a deep scan of a human and then can use a physical rendering system to produce a photorealistic image of that person and therefore a photorealistic video of that person and therefore a photorealistic video of them saying things that they've never said. What are the ethical implications of perfect rendering? Right? So it might not be where you'd first think of it, but given how your technology could be used to fool people, right? so that would be a, a, the step down an ethical route for graphics. Um, there are all of these kind of, it basically Thinking about ethics, breaches of privacy, um, work and vulnerabilities that you're creating by the, the work you're doing, um, discrimination against particular people by the work you're doing. So those are kind of the ethical dilemmas that, that should be part of your thinking at all times as a professional. Um, <coughs> so yeah, so for the social media application um, that Tor Martin's, Tor Martin's making is that... Um, for achieving goals, um, I have featured for public challenges. There could be an ethical dilemma around users creating unethical and dangerous challenges. Um, so this is like anything that uses GPS and um, challenges where you move. Um, so one of the, the 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 games that one of my students previously made at at um, in Yervik was a tower defense game, a GPS based tower defense game, where it used the um, Open Street Maps. Um, uh, OMS, uh, OSM maps um, to say, oh, look, I can map your current town. I could have creepers come in from one side of town and go through the, the streets of the town and then come out the other end and you would physically run around and place towers on the corners of streets to shoot the mob, the creepers, as they came through your town. Um, the problem is when you look at your phone and run across the road, you get hit by cars. Um, and so... Ethically, you can't release that game. Even though it might be fun, it creates an incentive to put, uh, that puts people in a dangerous situation. <clears throat> and so that's, that breaches the do no harm, right? So, so you've got to think about that sort of thing. So going beyond just the, hey, this is a cool piece of tech, I can get this thing done, into the, okay, what happens when people start using my tech? What does it promote? Who does it influence? What are their situations? How is that? Is that good or bad? Or, or what effect does that have? Okay. Um, and so I got back to what Andrea said about not having ethical dilemmas. This is um, this is an interesting challenge in society. That that what we're doing is we seem to be extending um, teenagerhood. 
um, in both directions. So younger kids are seeing content that teenagers no- normally see and, and sexualized content and, and having to deal with those. But we're also extending the other end where you're not having to make challenging decisions about ethical dilemmas because we've tried to construct society so that you don't have to that it is not the case that you have to make life and death decisions that you don't come across a trolley problem where oh my god i've only got five dollars and i can either bread buy bread for this person or i can feed that person who i don't feed is going to die oh shit um we We've tried to construct society so young people don't have to make those decisions. And so we push back the taking responsibility for actions and having to think deeply about the ethical consequences and the moral and social consequences of your actions. Um, and so, yes, for people, the argument is that people aren't maturing as, as, as early, and yet they're both maturing earlier and later. So it seems to be expanding this period where you're not, necessarily having to make those harsh decisions um you could argue that that, that, that both either a good or a bad thing um i mean it's it's great that we've found ways to try and and mean that people don't have to make these harsh decisions um but it does mean that you don't get used to making harsh decisions uh and so i know i i personally i made quite a lot of harsh decisions when I was quite young because my parents gave me authority over who I would live with um, when they split up. So so I'd been making life-changing decisions from early on. Um, and so for me, it was quite reasonable to ask, uh, to, to have the, the dilemma of which parent would I live with and which group of friends will I have and which school will I go to. And if I make that decision, it's a um, three months before you see one or other of your parents again. So it's a it was a big decision as a as an eight year old to to decide that, um, and so this movement into okay, how do I weigh up options? How do I like knowing that I'm going to hurt somebody with whatever decision I make, I'm going to have to make a choice. So um, those sort of challenges, most kids don't have to do that. Um, the they you know they get little ones like you know, um, you get pocket money, your friend doesn't. Do you? give some of your pocket money to your friend because you want to share, right? That, or do you keep it for yourself, right? So that, that's a kind of mini ethical dilemma. Um, but it's not, it doesn't have serious consequences. And that's when ethics really matters is when there are consequences both for you and other people. Okay, so that's um, 9.45. Um, I've set the initial draft hand in for your reports on this Friday night um, so that I can have a look over them over the next week um, and give you feedback on your reports saying where I think you're going right well and where I think you, you might want to expand um, and just general comments on, on, on how you're writing. Um, And then we have the final submission, and I do need to check this because I did check it. But um, So the 16th um, was when I'd set the final submission, Um, and then I will read those, and we have an oral exam focused on your report on the 23rd. Okay, so um, those are all on the wiki. Uh, I will post those again into the Discord so everybody sees them another time. Uh, It is there. Um, Go and have a look at that. Um, Make sure you understand what you're trying to achieve. There is a draft of the kind of things I want you to fill in. Um, Again, you don't have to include all the areas. um, And if they don't, if they don't align with what you've tried to do, then you don't need to include them. Um, But do try and describe your technology to your peers. As, a, as, as an objective. Okay. So, any other comments from from the audience? Either on YouTube or, or on Discord? I, I've still got eight of you watching me on YouTube and, and none of you have made a comment on the chat on YouTube. So, I assume that some of you are on Discord. And they've made chats there, but there's only two of you listening to me there. But anyway, um, okay, well, um, thank you for following me through with this discussion. It would be interesting to see your responses. Um, hopefully, I presented some of those discussions, and, and you could see when I was discussing the answers that different groups have, 
each every group could argue um you'd rather use this could you? um each each of those positions could be argued as a, as an ethical position right so this is not something that you should just um uh yeah this is it's not something that i i know the right answers to they're just their positions and you should regardless of what your position is you should have an understanding that you are making ethical choices whenever you implement technology or whenever you you engage in a project you are making ethical decisions so um, so think about the ethics and who is influenced by the technology you implement and the, the work that you do. Okay, have a good pre-project planning meeting and um, I look forward to having all of you submit um, a draft on Friday. Okay, good night.